This is Immersive Talk, the podcast all about the people, processes, and technology behind the immersive industry and experiences in the Southwest and beyond. I'm your host, Harrison Wilmot, New Talent Immersion Fellow with the Southwest Creative Technology Network and Tits Optimist Podcaster. In this chapter, I have a great conversation with another New Talent Immersion Fellow, Marcus Smith. Marcus talks to me about his deep thinking journey during the fellowship and how he thinks immersive technology could disrupt and cultivate new development in the mediation, conflict resolution, and restorative justice industries. The Immersive Talk podcast is evolving into something bigger and more exciting soon, which I'll explain in more detail at the end of the podcast. So for now, here's my conversation with Marcus, kicking off with him introducing himself. Yes, so my name is Marcus Smith, and I am a new talent fellow like on, myself. on Swockton, or Southwest Creative Technology Network. My background is very varied. I do radio presenting on Bristol Community FM. I have an acting background, also a political background as well, running my own social enterprise called Political Animal. I've done bits for charity, Prince's Trust, local government in Bristol, London, New York, all over the place. But there's that general thread, I would say, of trying to make the world a better place using creative methods to do so and that led me very nicely to the southwest creative technology network how did you hear about it on the website of watershed and then i had a few people send the opportunity to me as well they're like hey you should do this yeah nice Um, people recognize that your particular way of looking at the world could benefit from the Immersion Fellowship. I like to think so. (laughs) I like to think so. So yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for forwarding me the opportunity. And uh, yeah, here I am on the fellowship. (laughs) So what kind of questions did you uh, ask yourself uh, within deep thinking phase of the fellowship? So initially, my research question and area of interest was around equality and unconscious bias in a number of forms, race and disability and gender, etc. Then after some conversations and a lot of deep thinking and conversations with other fellows, it, it changed because actually there is a bit of fatigue, I would say, in the immersion industry of these point of view games and scenarios where you're trying to change people's behavior and perception when it comes to unconscious bias and racism Mm -hmm. and sexism, etc. It's been done a lot. It's been tried a lot. Tried a lot. There's conflicting evidence of whether it's when you're just putting something in somebody's mind and making them think of an elephant, basically or whether they're actually changing their perspective. We don't, we don't think they're, we're actually changing their perspective anymore. <laughs> or what do you think? So is that the consensus now that I That's what I'm work? feeling like. The, the, a lot of the kind of practitioners and thinkers in this area, or the people I've been spoken to, the other fellows, and on Twitter, <laughs> there seems to be a kind of consensus that the myth of the empathy machine that VR is or was in the same way that film was said to be the empathy machine, is not so simple as that. And there's a lot more nuance to it. And you can't just put something in front of somebody's, you can't just put somebody in a situation and then make them be that person. There's a whole other process to it. Um, One thing which came up around recently is a an immersive um, poverty experience in Birmingham, which has like brought a lot of people kind of raging at it, going, this is ridiculous. You can't just put people in a poverty situation and expect them to have their minds changed. But I'm still on the fence about it. I'm still like, well, actually, you could, you can just put them in a situation and let them think about it. And then the kind of the nuance can happen in their own mind rather than, um, rather than the kind of the, VR, the immersive maker having to think of all that nuance to then s- stick in that person. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it a lot. <laughs> I think I think there is potential of those experiences, but I think 
particularly when it comes to sensitive topics, poverty, race, gender, disabilities. I think people just have to be very careful and, and, and thoughtful mm-hmm. about it. And, you know, you know what this sort of industry is like. It's people competing for funding as well. So I yeah. think a lot of these tests, they may sort of over-exaggerate <laughs> yeah. the success to get funding. Yeah, but hey, I mean, you know, every industry does it. But I just think it's good to be mindful of that. And then I had a, a, a chat. I think it was uh, one of the fellows, Anthony, that does projection mapping. A 10-second 20 second conversation with him just totally transformed my uh, research question. Nice. Be- because I, I was going I along. I love those conversations. I love it, yeah. <laughs> I call them mind explosions. Because mm. like, initially, and I guess a lot of people think, when you think of immersive technology, virtual reality, you think of goggles straight mm. away. But actually, after that conversation with Anthony, I was like, maybe goggles will do the opposite of what I'm trying to achieve. Because if I'm trying to bring people together and trying to get people to understand each other more, mm. You're putting something in front of their eyes. You're effectively blindfolding them, aren't you? You're isolating them. Yeah. You're further isolating people. Yeah. Almost sort of making it more non-human in a way. Mm. So he said cave. And I was like, but what do you mean? So I did research um, about these uh, cave environments, mm. virtual reality cave environments. Some people use domes. Some people use projection mapped rooms. And I was like, let's make immersive experiences shared yeah instead of isolating people let's make it shared so people in the same space and making it as immersive as possible Mm. and then i moved away from equality unconscious bias and i moved into the area of mediation and conflict resolution that's interesting so kind of a um like a therapy space a safe space to see each other and listen to each other explain more about it so yeah, then then after that brainwave, I started doing a lot of research into mediation mm-hmm. and conflict resolution. So arguably, you could say the world is very polarised at the moment mm. and has become even more so. You think of Brexit, the divisions that Brexit caused mm. in Parliament and in public in general. I think something like... It's 50-50 now of whether your parents will still be together by the time you're 16. Mm. So family separation and divorces. So there's all this conflict happening in the world. So I thought, how about if we can use this immersive technology to help heal those wounds that have been created? We may not always agree with each other, but maybe we can come to some sort of compromise or better understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And then immersive mediation came to mind. Immersive mediation. That's really interesting. Keep going. Sorry. (laughs) No, it's fine. Um, So I went into research of the mediation uh, industry in the UK and globally. So there's different sorts of mediation. There's civil and commercial. That happens among businesses Mm. or... So if there's like a a rift between two businesses, there's a company which comes in and mediates oh, that makes sense that's good. is that what lawyers are actually mediation people <laughs> arguably but they cost a lot more oh, okay gotcha <laughs> they cost a lot more yeah. and if it does go through court mm. then there's a lot more cost involved and what whatever the decision is it's legally binding yeah. gotcha whereas with mediation it's something you can do before something goes to court mm. costs a lot less and the outcome is something that's agreed upon between the parties. Yeah, so it's a, a positive all-round kind of agreement at the end rather than a settlement. You'd like to think so. You'd like to think so. There's a few benefits of mediation. So there's greater control between the disputing parties. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go to court, it's up to the judge and more mm. the solicitors, etc. It's confidential, it's private. Whereas if you go to court, that's a public sphere, isn't it? Mm. It's voluntary as well. So both parties have to agree to go through this process. You can't be forced to do it. Um, Convenient and it's not as expensive as going through court. It can be a faster outcome. I mean, some court cases go on for years, don't they? Mm. So hopefully this will be quicker. And hopefully it can preserve relationships better as well. Yeah. Because quite often when there's a court ruling, one party feels like they've been hard done by. Yeah. 
But if you go through the mediation process, then it's more of a compromise and you've agreed it more. Yeah. But as I said, there's lots of different types of mediation. There's civil and commercial mediation, so between businesses and, I don't know, between different entities in public life. It, you know, it could be against your neighbour for them not cutting their hedges, etc. Uh, and then there's, then there's families as well. But then also there's workplace mediation as well. So mm. employees in a workplace not getting on. I think the most common place of the most common area of conflict in the workplace is between an employee and their line manager yeah that happens quite a lot and that can cause stress and anxiety um a decrease in productivity totally because one person feels like the line manager feels they need to get the person to do the job but the employee might be thinking they are doing the job and that they're not or they're not doing enough or there's just communication breakdown and everyone just like gets tense because there's like an overarching like you got to work type feeling everyone's just like doesn't really talk about it and i've been in this situation before <laughs> yes same same yeah yes. i've had a i've had to have a mediated conversation um mm. like with me and a line manager in a job that i had in london um it was an internal hr mm. person that came to mediate the uh, the meeting um but what increased was, what was it like um emotionally emotionally was it a relief to have an extra person in there to mediate it or was it uh, scary? Do you feel like you were being told off or mm. regulated? Um, <laughs> I'd say a bit of both, to be honest. It was great to have a third person in the room because my line manager at the time was a very strong personality. Mm. I mean, that was why I partly liked him and partly why I didn't like him. Yeah. Um, but also you kind of felt the odds were a little bit stacked against you anyway, because I mean, I'd only been in the job for like a year or so, mm. and he'd been there for 10, 20 odd years. So um, the total value of civil and commercial mediated cases in the UK since 1990 is approaching, are you ready, 110 billion Whoa. and has contributed to savings of 28.5 billion. So that's just civil and commercial cases. And then there are around 2.5 million separated families with dependent children in the UK at the moment. And that works out roughly at about quarter of a million parents separating each year. So the clientele wow. is <laughs> is there and yeah. always will be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there's all, yeah, there's always going to be disagreements. In yeah. Place. Yeah. Um, four in ten UK employees report some form of interpersonal conflict at work in the past year. So that's about forty percent. And then something we haven't mentioned yet: hate crimes. Hmm. So hate crimes in the UK have increased by 30%, uh, 30%, a lot more since the Brexit uh, vote. So again, there's that conflict again between different groups. And maybe one way that we could heal hate crimes is this immersive mediation technique. Have you heard of restorative justice? No. Tell me about that. So Gareth Thomas he was the uh, uh, Welsh rugby player, mm -hmm. and he was recently the victim of a gay hate crime mm. in Cardiff by some young young guy. And instead of pressing charges against the perpetrator, he went down the restorative justice route, which means it was him and the perpetrator in a room with a mediator, and Gareth Gosh. wanted him to try and understand what he did. Yeah how it made him feel, give him a little bit of spiel in history about gay rights and gay activism and hate crimes, etc. And in the end, the perpetrator apologised. And I just feel like, I mean, not everyone can do that, not mm, everyone can do that, but I just feel that's right. such a powerful way for that person not to do that again and to understand what they did. So I'm thinking some sort of immersive experience similar to that, which could be used in 
restorative justice cases mm. as well. So, I mean, civil and commercial, families, workplace, hate crimes, restorative justice, there's a lot of options with mediation. So roughly around 60 to 90% of all family and commercial mediation outcomes involved successful agreements. So it's pretty... It's good to hear. Pretty high, good to mm. hear. Um, and then, however, the mediation profession is in the hands of a few people. Apparently, it's around like 200 individuals are involved in about 85% of all commercial cases. Whoa, yeah. just 200? Just roughly 200, yeah. And the experienced bunch. And the association or maybe like the governing body of dispute resolution argues that the field will only continue to thrive if it can offer the market new talent. So as I said earlier, the average age of a mediator is 59 years old um, and roughly only 10% are from a BME background mm. compared to about almost 20% of solicitors. So what's needed in the mediation industry is a, a, a disruptive innovation. Mm. What's that I hear you say? So uh, it's an innovation that creates a new market and value network, displacing established market leading firms, products and alliances. So I sort of think the old school mediators will keep doing what they do and, you know, which, which they've been doing successfully for many years. Some of the top, top, top commercial mediators earn roughly nine to ten grand a day. Wow. That's, that's the top dogs. That's the top dogs. Yeah. And that's rare. <laughs> yeah. Um, but most earn a few hundred a day, maybe up to a thousand if they're really good. However, I think as millennials are increasingly growing into positions of influence within corporations and communities, then immersive mediation will question that traditional dispute resolution processes and sort of meet their and, and mm. our needs. So immersive mediation, that's where I got to. Nice. Yeah. Have you come across anybody who's done a similar thing or tried to do a similar thing to what you're trying to do? Yes. Or have an idea of what you want to do? Yes. Let me just... Because uh... it it's kind of in the same realm as the Chris Milk dream of trying to change people's minds mm. using VR. Mm. But this is more... This feels like, because you've taken the headsets away, this feels like more of a intimate kind of shared immersive training exercise in empathy rather than a um a kind of forced empathy what's the word it's kind of like um oppressive empathy <laughs> yeah so there's been there's been lots of there's been lots of studies around immersive conflict resolution but a lot of them are using the headsets Yes. Like most most cases. There was one that was used in East Africa somewhere where they had opposing farmers um, wear VR headsets to meet the other farmer. Did and they... it was created as like a, some sort of documentary and... I was don't that know. to solve the problem? They, did they not want to meet in person? No, because it's like there was like a history of sort of conflict. Mm. It was over land, land disputes, etc. Sort of historic divides mm. between these um, groups of people, and it was turned into a documentary. But what was the name of the documentary? It was called um, "Meet the Soldier," ah. and it was done by a uh, a, a VR organisation called Hack the Planet, a social enterprise mm. based in Amsterdam. But I don't know, there wasn't real any sort of concrete data that came out of that. It was just like a sort of a documentary that was created. Then there was another study in Montreal that created a, a 3D secure space for an interaction between delinquents and avatars. So it was trying to make, oh. it was trying to make uh, pedophiles better understand 
and empathize with with victims. So you're putting them in a headset to see if they can sort of understand what they're doing is harmful to yeah. those that they um then they target. Yeah. So that's like a really interesting study. And then there was one. There's been a few to do with the Israel Palestine conflict as well. Oh yeah. There's been a few examples of them. I think in a art gallery in in Israel. People put on headsets, and then one part of the experience is a Palestinian home, and then the other part is an Israeli home, and participants can go between the two homes and environments, and it's just to show that you know they're not so different; mm. they have more in common than they have different. So uh, that seemed to work really well, actually. The feedback from that has been really positive. And anecdotal evidence has shown that it's helped people build that sort of empathy and better understanding among those two groups. But again, using goggles, yeah, <laughs> using goggles, which has been done so much, and uh, that's where I want to try and get away mm. from. If you break it down, mediation is two disputing parties or individuals with a third person to mediate. Mm-hmm. And it's not the role of the mediator to be judgmental in any way or, or, or bias or come up with a solution because mm. that's up to the parties to do that. So you're just purely there to facilitate in a way. Using immersive tech, so from goggles, then I went to thinking about a dome environment. Yeah or some people called it a cave environment. But a lot of the domes that I looked at were either like really, really pricey or just a bit too small and maybe a bit claustrophobic. Mm. I think, um, is it Mike at Plymouth University? Yeah, he's got an inflatable one, um, isn't he? They have inflatable domes and he said, it's quite cosy. Yeah. It's a, it feels like a little bit of a birthing experience. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, so I was like, ah, oh, so what can be done? And also with a dome as well, you're a bit limited because it seems that you can only project onto the roof or like the top of the dome. Yeah. So, I mean, how immersive is that? Mm. Are you going to go through this mediation experience and just look up at the roof while you're, while you're talking? Mm. So then, after more research um, and talking to a few other, I talked to Neil from oh, yeah. We Are Shop. Then I started talking to Limbic cinema oh yeah who deal with projection mapping and they're like projection mapped room yeah that's the that's the way to that's do it. the solution that's the way to do it you're in a room fully immersed three four walls up down so should i go through the process of how it would work yes. so say it's a for example a separating couple mm-hmm. i would meet each person individually beforehand which happens in traditional mediation as well to get their story, their side, their perspective, their paperwork, etc. That's traditionally, but with my immersive mediation idea, I could also um, collect images, mm. footage, maybe of happier times. Yeah. Because, you know, they got together for a reason, hopefully. Um, mm. And then also the role of children as well in mediation. In the UK, we're quite bad at it. We don't really involve the children. Whereas in other places, in Europe, Scandinavia, and I think Canada and New Zealand, other places, they involve the children a lot more. They actually bring them into the actual process, into the room. But there's not really a culture of that in the UK. So maybe we could get the, collect the children's perspective on where they want to live mm. and how they see things going forward and how they feel. So you collect all this data, footage, imagery, sounds beforehand. And then afterwards, you bring the people, the the couple together, Mm. the separating couple together into this projection mapped room. So we'll follow the traditional mediation tried and tested process as much as possible, but with the added value of we can use, we can surround the room, we can immerse the room in each other's perspective yeah so we can start with one perspective they'll show all their imagery and data etc how they see things and then we can do that with the other person and just you're you're immersing each other in each other's perspective and how you view the conflict and what you feel should be the best path forwards now why why would this be better than traditional mediation number of reasons 
people are better at learning through audio stimulation, visual stimulation. We're not all good mm. with words and pieces of yeah. paper so and talking. you're accommodating different learning styles. So you're accommodating different learning styles. There's lots of evidence and studies around, it was Mike at Plymouth that sent me this, around how such immersive experiences can trigger memories. Mm. It helps with your memory and helps you remember things better yeah. and emotions as well. But in amongst each other's perspectives, and as you just said about this room in Sunshine, the movie, in amongst this, there will be those moments of calm and reflection. Because mm. it can be quite, I guess, yeah. in a, 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 an attack on all your senses of yeah. seeing each other's perspective. So in amongst them, break it up. So there'll be moments of pause. Moments of pause, calm, calming noises, calming sounds. So people can sort of digest and take yeah. in what they've just heard. But in amongst all this, there will be room for chat and yeah. traditional mediation as as well. Yeah, the, the role of a mediator is not to be biased mm. or judgmental. It's to allow the parties to articulate each other's perspective and then to enable them to come to a, a mm. solution and an so outcome. If, if, the, if each party is choosing like their own images and their own kind of data to be projected in this room, aren't they then curating their own argument, their own presenting their own um, case towards the conflict? And would, or would there be a, an element of mediation? Would you, you as the mediator filter some of that content and reveal it or not reveal it at certain times? Yeah, I mean, this is what I wanted to try out in the prototype phase because the role of the mediator in this example is really powerful because you're almost in a way curating Mm. you're curating what you've heard and what you've got from those individual meetings with the disputing couple and then you're hopefully working with them you come to some sort of come to some sort of two to three minute piece that can be ah uh, gotcha that can be shown in the room but as also helping visual and auditory learners as well there's a lot of evidence that suggests immersive experiences retains people's attention and motivation yeah. more than yeah. just people talking or, or lengthy legal documents. And also what I really like about this potential in terms of hate crime and restorative justice, with this, with this example, the mm. keyboard warriors, they can't hide. Mm. You have to take responsibility for your opinion yeah. and for your perspective. I feel like this kind of experience would be better for restorative justice situations rather than a mediation because i feel like when you're completely immersed in a an experience i feel like if two or more kind of themes or ideas were trying to like compete for for space it would be difficult whereas in a restorative justice case it's, it's only it's one ideal it's one theme which is trying to get its idea across. Um, it might be easier. <laughs> it might be a bit easier, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, how do you... But do you understand what I'm saying in terms of keyboard warriors having to take responsibility? Yeah. Because we live in such a world now with social media and the internet where people are just mouthing off with the most sort of disgusting comments made at people and then just being able to hide... And There's not take responsibility of, um, for it. Consequenceless actions. Yes. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people just kind of saying things for just to say it, or mm. or just to be heard. I suppose. I think it's. I think it might be like a symptom of the kind of the the general again illiteracy of listening, where people have don't feel they're listened to so they keep on saying things and, and trying to be heard and just ending up saying horrible horrible things to each other and I think having a space where you can where, where someone can have what can say something to someone else without being interrupted or and and having it that space to and then reflect on what they've just heard like in a restorative justice space 
um, could encourage then that person who was in the wrong to go, well, actually, so this is a space where someone can be heard. I don't have to say horrible things online. I can, I can mm. go to a place. Perhaps there could be a, a kind of like a, um, a VR chat type space or... Like a safe, a safe space. Yeah. I think the beauty of mediation is that it's a safe space. It's a neutral ground. Mm. So it will take you out of the environment that's sort of the bed of the conflict. And then, you, and then you're taken out of that. Mm. Somewhere neutral, somewhere safe, somewhere different. And hopefully it can alter yeah, people's you can thinking. feel safe to describe the conflict how you see it. And then for someone to be listening. And then at the end of it go... Yes, I understand how you feel. Yeah. I think that's what just people want. <laughs> so do you feel um, that um, in, a, in, a, in a all like mediation situations, there's, um, what do you think is the, the cause of the main conflict? Do you think it's with personality, ego, or do you think it's experience, which... Um, kind of divides people or kind of stops people seeing um, things from another's perspective um, and how, how do you think um, how, how do you feel that an immersive mediation space will uh, aid in that yeah um, <laughs> I mean the reason why people can have conflict or disagreement is all the above what you said really it can be down to personality and different traits that people have as as in terms of character but also it can be down to a disagreement in how to do things as well mm. that's so, down to like experience as well like the some things have worked better for other people yeah and it's and my understanding is that it's, it's about showing people or listening to people first and how they think it should go and then showing people how you think it should go mm. and then finding a balance in between. And then I think it would be really cool to have that conversation in a space where you are surrounded by it, the, the environment, the issue, and you can... If it was, if, I'm imagining it like a creative space where you can conjure objects to illustrate what you're trying to say and you can like paint uh, or like put text and words and things or animate situations to convey properly what, you're, what the conflict is to the other person. And the other person can do that but in like a completely different way and arrive at the same um, conflict point but from, a, from their uh, interpretation of it. And then you've got two pictures or three kind of sculptures of conflict, of the kind of the experience of people arriving at that conflict, all coming into one kind of space where they are. They're occupying that and like literally occupying the kind of representation of the conflict. And everyone can see what's going on, hopefully, and understand where it, each one's coming from. And then they can just sit down and talk about it. Is that what was in your mind as well? Yes. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greatly articulated. So um, which so do you think immersive yeah. mediation will be an addition to the mediation industry or replace it? I think both. I think there's sort of old school mediators. I think the average age of a mediator in the UK at the moment is about 59, predominantly male as well. I think they'll probably stick to the... Mm, they're all guns. tried and tested methods yeah. but sort of as the millennials come into more positions of power across public life and corporate life I think uh, yeah they'll be more up for this yeah. way forward I think What's, what's your next step? Not necessarily like the next month or so, but where where do you feel um, you'll be with this? 
or where do you hope to be with this by let's say like june july time nice um for the showcase <laughs> well this beautifully crafted podcast will mm. be a result yep it'll be on online hopefully i think it's been may or june time oh gosh june's coming up quick <laughs> yeah. i'll try and release it as soon as i can <laughs> I, i've missed out uh april <laughs> <laughs> um and also i'm gonna create some sort of report paper or business plan oh, i've done so much research yeah. like i've got ridiculous amounts of research yeah. around this so it Have just seemed to be to a any waste. Of the um, mediation associations. Yes, I have been in contact. I've even gone to some training to become cool. an actual mediator. So what was that like? Um, really good, really good fun actually. Was it anything like you expected? Were there some surprises? It was. It was as I expected actually, ah. but it was more the know-how, an actual practical skills of what to do and what to say when you're in a room with mm. people that are pissed off with yeah. each other i suppose you have to be prepared for a lot of things do you think that's why the age of them age of mediators is quite high is because they've got all that experience yeah and that's that's fine mm. as well that is fine but times change technology changes I think the lady who was conducting the training, I went with the National Family Mediation Group or Society of some sort, and she was saying increasingly mediations are taking place through Skype. Yeah, that sounds about right. And online dispute resolution is increasing as well. But that just seems a bit cold and detached. Mm. But um, yeah, so technology is creeping in. But I'm like, why stop there? Because it could be so much more powerful, so much more effective if we were to use immersive tech. Yeah. Get people. So let's try it out. Let's let's roll with it. So if there's any funders, <laughs> <laughs> any investors, any uh, academic institutions that really want to give this a go, then please do get in touch because I think there's I think this really does have legs. There's commercial viability as well. And there's a whole heap of partners that I've got interested. I've mm. got TLT solicitors. They've got a, uh, a a mediator who has 30 years experience who is really keen to uh, work with me. Um, also That's Limbic cool. Cinema as well, who oh, yeah. have clients including the old Vic, Colson Hall in Glastonbury, et cetera, as well. Um, I've got someone who is a... Uh, uh, honorary doctorate in the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So all these people are really excited. It would just be really useful to get some sort of funding and support to do some sort of study or trial yeah. to see if, if this people works. are interested in getting involved with you or getting you involved with what they're doing. How do they do that? How do they get hold of you? Yeah, please do. So my name is Marcus Smith. I'm on all the social medias. M for Marcus, N for Neville, R for Richard Smith. So MNR Smith, I'm on all the socials under that username or send me an email, mnrsmith at gmail.com. And I'll also have a website, mnrsmith.uk. Or you can just get in touch through the Southwest Creative Technology Network. Bro, thank you very much for talking to me, Marcus. Harry, really absolute pleasure. Big, big thank you to the Southwest Creative Technology Network as well for allowing me the time and space to come up with this idea and deep thinking as well. And it's been a very enjoyable experience. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the fifth chapter of Immersive Talk. The music you hear throughout the show is called TikTok by Glad Rags which I found on cchound.com. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, there's some evolution happening with Immersive Talk, or more accurately, some merging. Now, a couple of months ago, I was approached by the Southwest Creative Technology Network to help them create a podcast revolving around conversations between the Immersion Fellows, hosted and edited by myself and produced by a really lovely guy called Lucas Robbins. 
Now, as we've recorded these conversations and generally discussed the future of both podcasts, it became clear and it made sense to merge them into something new. So as of mid-July at the Immersion Cohort Showcase, uh, the 12th and 13th, we'll release a new podcast, which is as of yet unnamed, and it will be the spiritual successor to Immersive Talk and an altogether greater scoped podcast all about the creative technology people in the Southwest and beyond, including all the various cohorts and fellows spread out between all the various initiatives going on at the moment in the Southwest, which is super exciting. No doubt you'll hear about it from me via all the Twitters and such. Yeah, thank you, and I'll see you in the future.